I hope you had a good night for the ones who were here yesterday and uh, eventually had a nice party, networking party. Uh, today we're going to start uh, the opening uh, with a 45-minute sessions where we're going to discuss about one important topic, uh, which is GDPR. And for this first uh, session, I'm going to invite uh, our moderator, Krishina Mileva who is a co-founder, CEO, and legal counsel at Dovu, and who will uh, introduce our uh, panel. Thank you. Bonjour. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be opening today's session uh, in talking about GDPR. It, it's one of my passions, and, and the panel today is absolutely amazing. Um, so I'm really, really, really happy that um, you'll be able to hear um, those amazing panelists this morning. Um, and without further ado, I'm just going to like to introduce them all. Um, I'm going to start with the ladies today. Um, so we have um, Karima Deli, who is a president um, of the Committee of the Transport and Tourism and the European Commission, followed by... It's Leticia um, Antoine, who is the founder and CEO of Connect Things. Um, Mr. Winston Maxwell, who is a partner in Hogan Lovells. And uh, Mr. Andrew Grant, who is analyst in um, Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Um, so I'm not going to talk about what they're doing. I'm just going to let them introduce themselves and tell us a bit about their work and how GDPR is involved in their work. Um, so whoever wish to start, um, maybe we could start with Karima, if you would like to say a few words about your work and um, yeah. Hello everyone, I'm Karima Deli. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I'm an, an ecologist. Yes, I'm the member of European Parliament. I'm the chairwoman of Transport uh, Committee. Um, before we jump into um, the technical issue of uh, GEP here, I wanted to share with you my vision about uh, the mobility, the future of mobility. I believe the future of mobility is clear. Tomorrow, mobility will be low carbon, inclusive, safer and connected. Connected is very important because we talk about uh, um, sharing economy and uh, automa automation of vehicles, for example. To allow um, all of this uh, innovation to happen, we need the right access to data, the right quantity and quality of data, and the right um, right processing of this data. And uh, the reason why, uh, uh, for me, is very important this discussion, but we are discussing today in of implementation of GDP year of transport today, and my conclusion before we even start to open this discussion is we need now to find the right balance between data privacy, data protection against, uh, for example, cyber attack, and the use of data of the operators themselves, and also a new uh, commerce uh, like startups. Thank you. No, that's a great segue, uh, Karima, because what I wanted to say in the introduction is that, you know, the GDPR uh, reflects kind of a schizophrenia that we have to work with, which is, on the one hand, uh, personal data is a fundamental right. And so when you talk about personal data, it's like talking about your children. So you don't sell your children into slavery. Uh, it's a fundamental right. But at the same time, personal data needs to be shared. Uh, it, it is an object of commerce. Uh, the second, the D in ADESA uh, for autonomy, the, the acronym is ADESA. The second D is data analytics. And what Karima was saying is that to create a successful ecosystem to lower pollution, to encourage intelligent transport services, et cetera, 
you need to have data sharing, you need ecosystems, you need data commerce. And so it's very hard to reconcile those two worlds, the vision that data is you know, the equivalent of a, of a part of my body, fundamental rights versus data is an object of commerce that can actually increase the collective good. Thank you. Maybe you can introduce yourself, no? <laughs> Sorry, I'm Winston Maxwell, a partner at Hogan Levels and specialized in data issues. And you wrote a very interesting uh, document about blockchain and data protection. Yes, yes, we, and we'll, we'll talk about blockchain uh, maybe later in, maybe the, in, in, the, in the panel, but yeah. that's one of the, the interests yeah. that we have, yes. So um, I am Laetitia Gazelle-Antoine, and I am the CEO and founder of Connectings. Connectings is a startup that I founded in Paris uh, more than 10 years ago, and now I am based in uh, New York to expand the Connecting uh, on the North American market. And uh, what we do at Connectings is uh, really linked to um, personal data, so it's a very important subject for Connecting. Uh, as we have a solution that help mobile application to collect, collect uh, context and uh, location data about their user, even if the mobile application is closed. So for us, uh, we, we, so we help mobile application to know where their user use their application or don't use their, their application. And when I say where, it's uh, not only a latitude and longitude, it's uh, at home at work, uh, in a train station, and so on. So uh, it's important for a mobile application to better know their, its user, uh, for what, just to provide the user with a better experience. So this is where we have this question of balance between uh, collecting data, uh, personal data, to improve the user experience, and in the other end, what has been done so far a lot with data collected when people use the data for other purposes than the improvement of the service itself. And uh, at Connectings, we work with the cities for more than 10 years now. So when I say cities, is a public transportation mobile application. It's a car sharing and so on, mobile, uh, mobile application. So we have uh, really the personal data at the main purpose and then we do not share any personal data with other uh, people or with other actors than the mobile application itself. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Grant. I work at Bloomberg's primary research division, NEF. Uh, I work in a team looking at the four key trends in future mobility, so electric vehicles, uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, mobility services, and connected cars. Uh, some of those get more attention in the media than, than others and uh, in public discourse. Uh, electric vehicles have uh, celebrity CEOs like Elon Musk. Uh, autonomous vehicles have this sort of future of, uh, or science, uh, future that we've uh, imagined in science fiction. Uh, and then mobility services like Uber, Lyft, and Didi have had billions of dollars thrown at them. But it's connected uh, connectivity that sort of ties all, all um, those three together. Uh, at present, there are about 25% of all new vehicles globally have some form of embedded connection uh, in them uh, at the date of sale. Uh, that's going to rise to uh, more than 75% globally by 2025. Uh, it's going to be higher in Europe uh, as regulations like eCall uh, sort of encourage uh, various forms of connectivity. Uh, so what I'm saying is that there's going to be uh, substantial increase in the amount of uh, data that's, that's floating around out there and uh, discussing regulations as to how to handle it, like the GDPR, uh, is really important. So glad we're here today. Thank you very much for that. Um, and I guess I would be the last one to say a few words about our business and, and what we do um, and, and how GDPR affects us really. So um, we uh, use blockchain technology and uh, we use net economics. Uh, and reward to incentivize the individuals, uh, the users, uh, to change the way they travel um, and to touch upon Karima's view on the, the eco-friendly way of traveling. So we're helping um, to shift to that eco-friendly way of moving around and how do we uh, walk more, uh, 
how do we use cars which uh, have lower CO2 carbon emissions, how do we move to the whole eco-friendly way of transportation by incentivization. And, and for us as a business, um, GDPR is, is a very crucial one, especially when we speak about the technology that we're using. Um, so having said that, I think it's important for us to, to maybe talk a bit about um, the types of data that, that we see when we speak about the transportation sector as a whole and, and when we correlate that with GDPR, what are your views on, on the types of data that are being produced, so to speak, uh, from the typical ty different types of vehicles um, nowadays? Uh, GDP here was adopted in um, in uh, 2016 and implement this year in May, okay? And for us in the European Parliament, in the European Commission, uh, it is a, it has an impact on ETS, really, because uh, it's true the ecosystem of ETS is ma made. Uh, not only uh, on a physical infrastructure. And I totally agree with you, because when you talk about uh, technological infrastructure, to make simple, ETS is, rep is uh, replacing car with your smartphone as mean of transport. So we all know um, that your smartphone knows uh, a lot about use and uh, and send a lot of data. And when you talk about transport, transport is airline connected, car manufacturer, uh, transport authorities, giant platform uh, like uh, Uber, you know, yeah, you know, and Lyft collects your personal data. So those data are for me, are mostly personal data. That's the reason why, which fall under um, um, GDPR, because it includes uh, information like a passenger's name, uh, uh, contact information, address, etc., as well as smarter uh, information like uh, uh, travel uh, partners. Uh, a time, a recent journey on the fars, and when we um, when we can uh, argue about instant geo, geo, ge, geolocalization data, it's very important geolocalization data. You know that is a personal data, yes or no? For this one, for example, GDPR does not mention is. It uh, clearly is the reason why. So, for certain data, there is a room for interpretation, and sometimes we have a problem with this. I believe. Yeah, Winston, what is your view on that um, as a lawyer? Yeah, well, the, in, in, in the legal world, we divide data into two categories personal data and non personal data. But as Karima said, the frontier, the borderline between the two is not clear at all. And um, if, you, if you are a specialist in GDPR, you tend to think that anything that the car generates can potentially be qualified as personal data. Why? Uh, the tire pressure, for example, of a given car, uh, there may be a sensor and it, it goes back up to the, to the OEM or the maintenance platform. Um, if that tire pressure can be linked to a given car, uh, the car can then be linked to an individual. Now, you don't have to know the individual's name. That's, that's, a, that's sort of the misconception about personal data. It doesn't matter that, you know, I, I can't tell if it's Letitia. What matters is I can single out the data as corresponding to one uh, individual who may be the car owner. And if that's the case, then it's personal data. So in fact, you have you know, this dichotomy between personal data and non-personal data is very, very difficult to apply in practice. And you almost have to assume that most of the data that's circulating in, in, in mobility services 
is personal data, and then you have to go through the GDPR, jump through the GDPR hoops to see if, how you process it. So what, what I can add uh, to that is that e even e maybe there are some um, on the vehicle side, there are some question about what is personal or is that data personal or not. On the mobile side, I think, and this is a space where we are at Connectings, there is no uh, uh, really no question. I think that what we deal with uh, are personal data, for sure, for the mobile application. Yeah, and there's quite a uh, quite a few different stories you can tell with uh, location data. So if somebody's sort of having frequent trips to certain locations, if it's a hospital, you can discern things uh, like if, if it's a specific illness and uh, certain cases like that. But there's a lot of players that are uh, sort of utilizing this data. It's not just data that's generated in vehicles. We're also talking about uh, mobility service apps, uh, and, and that's data where uh, Patricia would be... Uh, uh, well versed to speak on this, uh, but it's your phone, it's in your pocket, you're carrying it everywhere you go. Um, so that's really detailed data. Uh, perhaps you can't make the argument that the location data co uh, collected by the vehicle is sort of uh, the vehicle's location as to as opposed to uh, your personal location. Uh, Leticia, I don't know if you've got anything to add. No, on. I, I think that's uh, that's exactly uh, that. So. Uh, so on the, on the mobile side, uh, when uh, an application, for example, or your browser collects your data, it's always a link, or there is a way to link to the, to, the, to, the, to the person, to the name of the person, so yes. I have a question, Patricia. So in, in Connect Things, um, when you have access to that data, if that data is encrypted, could that then mean potentially that you are hiding that personal data and you could avoid the GDPR um, element of it or um, do you have to necessarily have access to that data? So, um, uh, so when we implement or plug in a mobile application, the first step is that the user accept to be located. So you all have this in the, or say that when you download an application, first the application asks you if you are uh, you agree to, to share contact or to, to you accept to be located. So this is the first step. And now with GDPR, and I think it's a really good thing, is to explain why the mobile application will uh, collect that data. It's not just, and if you have two reasons why you want to collect, one for to improve the service, the other one to do analytics, for example, you have to explain the two reasons why you, 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 you collect the data. I think it's a really important, and it's, I think that for the whole business, uh, it's, a, it's a very good thing because we will create then trust with the, with the user. And then they will, because they will, be, they will know why they share the data, then they will, uh, they will, have, so they will accept maybe more peacefully to share that with a uh, with, uh, with, uh, with mobile application. So this is uh, the first step. And for connect things, when we collect uh, after that, the user accepts to share uh, the data with a mobile application, then yes, we use that to help to know better um, is, um, for example, is commuting in the city each morning, what is the commuting of the, the user? Uh, does he use a subway or uh, does he drive there? And uh, based on that, we will help the mobile application knowing better uh, its user to improve the service that he, he will deliver to the user. But the purpose is for the mobile application to know better the user for the best service. Great, thank you. So I think that we're all in agreement around the types of data coming out of, of vehicles and potentially what those types of data could be under GDPR. Um, I have a question for Karima. Uh, um, what is the view of the European Commission around that data and is there any um, official statement so far as to which data is being considered um, as personal and not uh, when we speak about data coming out of vehicles? Okay, I, I, uh, two things. First, uh, geolocalization data will tend to the, uh, consider uh, as personal data. Uh, meaning that uh, autonomous um, vehicles, for example, uh, would have to uh, comply with GDPR rules. For example, a permission would have um, 
to uh, be uh, to be given uh, by the driver before and tracking of uh, information take place. Even if we know, um, as uh, asking the driver if he wants his data to be recorded or no is relevant. So because with a, a ranking of data, the vehicle is not operable. But at the same time, we need this definition. Why? Because we don't want, for example, car, car manufacturers to have an exclusive access to in the vehicle's data. It's my, it's my point of view. I, I can share my point of view with you. Um, but it is a matter of, of a fair competition. And um, this is where uh, stands the European Commission right now based on two studies and uh, myself. So for me, GDPR can protect the autonomous driving sector against the monopol monopoly of manufacturer. For me, it's very important for your question. Thank you. Um, well, I think that um, I actually want to dive in a bit deeper and, and ask all of you, having said all of that, who do you think is the owner of that data then when we speak in a world of vehicles as we know it nowadays and when we speak about autonomous vehicles and what happens then? Who would I'll like to start? I'll, I'll start because that's one of my favorite <laughs> subjects. <laughs> Um, because this ownership of data debate is, is really uh, interesting because it, it highlights this almost religious battle between the fundamental rights team and the economics and growth team. <laughs> and you even see that in the European Commission. You see, uh, you know, the DG Justice, which is in charge of fundamental rights and the GDPR, and then you see DG Connect with the, you know, let's make, the, let's make this ecosystem, Internet of Things, uh, uh, intelligent transport services, um, a growth for everyone. Um, and so you, the, the, the people who talk about uh, growth and big data, they talk about, you know, there are a lot of papers on, you know, who should be considered the owner of the data? Should we open up data to third parties so that vehicle manufacturers are not, don't have some sort of monopoly? There's a lot of interesting reflection on it. Um, and at the same time, you have the uh, the fundamental rights people who say, oh, you can't talk about ownership. Please don't talk about ownership. It's like, it's like ownership of, you know, of, of, of my child. You, this is not possible. So don't, I don't want to hear it. Um, and and uh, the, the intersection between those two visions is very complex and, and interesting. And so far, you know, very few people have tackled that because, and, and I would mention, however, that some of the commission reports um, on, you know, should, do we need a new ownership right? Do we need to create a special ownership right to clarify? So far, uh, the studies have said, well, you know, the market seems to function fine without that. So we consider data as sort of a trade secret maybe, but we don't need a specific intellectual property right. So as long as, you know, the market seems to be functioning, we don't really need to do anything. That's sort of the position I saw from the Commission most recently. Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting one because I personally think that there should be some sort of new um, rights introduced there given where technology is going and, and given where the world is heading when we speak about especially autonomous vehicles and the data being um, mined. <laughs> every time that, that a car moves from, from point A to point B. Um, what is your view, Andrew? Yeah, so you mentioned what's coming out of the commission and uh, sort of the legislation uh, in this area, but what the, what, what's happening in some of the private sector applications, and I'll use BMW as an example, because it's quite a, an, a, an interesting case. Their BMW connected platform uh, will take cons uh, consumer data, so the vehicle data, put it in a, in a warehouse and then it offers it to third parties, but on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, you need approval from uh, individual, uh, uh, well, the individuals that have sort of generated the data in that vehicle. 
So to some extent, it is, uh, it, it's appeasing all parties. Uh, it's kind of pushing it, it down the line. Uh, but I think we're going to just see more of this kind of erring on the side of caution, making sure everybody signs off uh, until we have clearer rules. And this kind of brings me to a, a question uh, uh, for you, Winston, which is like how much of uh, GDPR uh, is still uh, waiting to be written? How much of it will uh, be defined through, uh, through case law uh, rather than uh, sort of the quite general uh, specifications that were put in place um, with, the con uh, with the consumer in mind when GDPR was implemented in May? Or, oh, yeah, or oh, Karima. Uh, I, I believe uh, your question is a very good question, really. We have a, t is a big challenge for the future. I say that because at this moment in, in Europe, it is a, a hurt f um, fight right now between a lot of lobbyists of different sectors, really. And uh, I believe we have three scenarios at the European level. It's, it's not only my scenarios uh, from uh, the European Commission, but we have th three scenarios from the European level, all European institutions. First of all, in vehicle data will belong, which I don't like, to car, car manufacturer. We have a, a black uh, a bank, a black blank uh, tech two, for example, Volkswagen for years to build a monopoly uh, uh, after a diesel gate, blah, blah, blah. For me, it's not a good option. The second option is vehicle data belong to GAFAMs. Uh, yes, we can easily imagine uh, that connected vehicle will be to product a new islands between GAFAM and manufacturer tomorrow. So GAFAM for, for the software and manufacturer for the hardware. And I, I don't like this scenario, I'm sorry. For me, this option, neither because it's too uh, much power in, uh, in their hand. And we have uh, seen recently how ever fa even Facebook, Facebook can easily be uh, breached. For me, my scenario is very e easy. And I would like to support this scenario, yeah. In uh, vehicles data belongs the driver. I believe is a, for me it's very important because he can consent to share uh, it uh, with a transport operator and any startups which need to access to those data for for their own ETAs. So it's my favorite option. I I can I would like to share you this open and to support this open. This, this option, because at this moment in Europe, we have this big fight, but we don't have time. So, so uh, I, I'm really aligned with this uh, third option. Uh, I think that as soon as you can, uh, uh, thanks to data, uh, just uh, you collect uh, or uh, have information about where the user was, where the, whether the person, uh, what kind of uh, mobility he used and so on. I think that it's like your, the memory of the, of, the, of, the, of the person. And I think that as soon as, I, I, I used to, to speak about uh, behavioral DNA. It's like, it's your story, it's yours. Uh, and if you want to share uh, with uh, one player, yes, there is no issue with that. But for me, uh, it's, I don't know if we say, the user is the owner of if we have to create a new ownership of that, sure. But I think at the end, it's like your DNA. So if you want to, to provide your DNA to improve a service or improve your life, you, 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 have, you can do that. But you have to control it. I, I respectfully disagree. No, I think the option three is a little bit uh, too simple. Um, because 
you know, the, a lot of the data that's coming from the car is necessary so that the car manufacturer can ensure that safety, uh, maintenance, uh, improving its own products. And, and for those aspects, it is, it is not reasonable to say that that belongs to the driver. Uh, because the, the OEM has their own regulatory obligations. They must assure that, you know, the, the vehicle is safe. Uh, and to do that, they need the data uh, because more and more cars are data-centric. So I, I think you need a balance between, you know, a certain uses. Certain uses of data are under the control of the driver. So if the, you know, if I'm using data to uh, sell advertisement or value-added services and things like that, you know, the driver should have total control. But when it comes to using data from the, from the vehicle that's necessary to ensure the safety of the vehicle, I think that belongs to the vehicle manufacturer and it's because it's their responsibility. But do you think that needs to be a fundamental right of the GDPR or is that something that's just so logical for the consumer that they would be opting in for that anyway? They're looking to improve their, their experience, their, their safety, so it's something that they would uh, willingly sign up for. Well, yeah, the GDPR provides different options, but um, typically uh, the sort of safety thing would, would, you would not ask the driver to consent because consent is a very, uh, very ephemeral thing. It's not very stable. And so when it comes to something serious like safety or sharing, sharing information with, with uh, road safety teams and so forth, e-call, you, you don't want to rely on consent. So you have other, uh, other tools in the GDPR that per permit you to say, you know, no, this is legitimate interest or it's necessary for uh, uh, under a regulatory requirement. Uh, so it's important to distinguish consent from other legal bases under the GDPR uh, and you want to avoid consent if, if, you want, uh, if you want something rock solid and that's as important as safety, you don't want to be going down the consent road. Right, and I mean, it does raise some like really interesting situations uh, say you, it's a mobility service company, uh, you want to know where your customers are even when they're not using the app so you can sort of allocate your, your vehicles. If you're, if you're a ride hailing company, uh, do you have a right to monitor them when they're not using the app? Uh, if they've just downloaded it once, and, uh, uh, is that something that they're uh, allowed to do? So there's a whole lot of really complex issues here. Uh, but if it's the improvements of the products uh, uh, that's at stake, then uh, perhaps there's a, a case for, uh, for, for what, you're, what you're saying. If it's a safety issue, then I, I think it's quite difficult to argue, uh, sort of ingraining that in, uh, in, in, in the, the regulation. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you, Andrew. And um, yeah, it's, it, it's a very complicated one. Um, when we speak especially about mass services and, and autonomous vehicles, it, it's a whole new field. And, and G when GDPR was written, um, technology wasn't being taken into consideration at all. And, and as we know, technology is evolving so quickly that uh, whatever legislation you draft, it's already outdated by the time it gets voted anyways. Uh, so I personally think that um, definitely a, a a new, better version of, of GDPR is definitely needed, um, or at least a bit of an amendment of, of what's <laughs> there at the moment. Um, so I, I want to head um, th the conversation to, to a bit of um, different um, route. What do you think about innovation, and what do you think about GDPR and innovation? Does GDPR stop innovation, or does GDPR is helping us to, to move forward and, and be more innovative when we speak transportation. And, and not only transportation, of course. Um, Leticia, what is your view? Um, I, I think that uh, so all of you know about Facebook problem with the data and the same for Google Plus with uh, the account that has been also um, attacked and so on. So. Um, I think that uh, there, there uh, we have now, uh, uh, not only in Europe, but also in the US, people are really concerned about the data and 
Con when I say concern, it's not that they don't want this, uh, this player, these players to have their data, but it's more about what kind of data do they collect and uh, why do they uh, earn so much money with my data and should I have a bit of that? It's, uh, it's mine and can I uh, erase my data and, and so on. So, so, so I think that there, um, all around that, now we are at, at a time where, where, uh, where uh, oh, 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 everyone is, um, is, um, yes, is, uh, is asking herself, should I control my data? Yeah, it, it's uh, it's an interesting one. Um, I, I note, especially when, when I'm in America or, or anywhere in the Asian world, actually, if you mm. want to buy something from the airport, mm. they pretty much ask for all of your personal data, your boarding pass, your passport. Mm. Why would you need that if I'm buying a pack of chewing gums, for example? Mm. Exactly. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. So Innovation, yeah. Innovation? Uh, <laughs> yeah, where we've seen it is uh, so auto manufacturer puts together a big data project uh, creates a data lake um, to do research, to discover new things. I think the GDPR penalizes a bit European big data projects, I, I think, uh, because when we see, when we, as lawyers, when we look at those projects, um, a, a big global OEM who sets up its data research lake in uh, in Michigan, for example, um, will not be as constrained in its research as a OEM who sets it up in Munich. Uh, and including the question of, okay, if I have in my data lake, if I have in my data lake, you know, data from drivers in Japan, you know, why should that be covered by the GDPR? And yet if you have your research center in Munich, you may absurdly have a situation where GDPR is applying to data from Japanese drivers. Okay. Uh, personally, I don't think um, GDP here hurt transport data innovation. Why? Because I, I believe uh, these privacy um, rules play a great uh, role on, for example, the social acceptance of the new uh, new mobility solution uh, and connected vehicles for example need a lot of trust from the customers uh, so I think GDP here will help secure to spread ETS um, in the entire society and at the same time there is a there is a tension between data protection and innovation. That's the reason why internet, as we know, it, it is neutral. As open contents, users, peer to peer. That's the reason why I believe pri privacy rules have a potential uh, to decrease of share of data. I'm still... Um, I'm still uh, trying um, for, um, um, for to figure out um, how can uh, do it without affecting innovation and startups, I believe. And, and when, uh, when we give uh, more control to the user, uh, I think that we create trust. And if we create trust, we will help the innovation. Uh, there are some sectors uh, in the startup world, but uh, not only startup, uh, where uh, the advertising space, uh, where they, they, they use to collect data and without the consent of the user, they share it with brand and, and so on. And I think that we can see like a stop there because uh, there are the, uh, every, uh, so they, they stop, they, they do things that are no, no, no allowed anymore with the GDPR. Uh, and I think that there you can see some uh, uh, less innovation. There's a lot of uh, things to adapt, and, and it's a, it's a, a little complex. But but um, uh, I think that uh, as soon as we think with uh, sustainable services, innovative services, we it's, I, I, it's, I think it's a big chance. I I think the uh, the effect on innovation has been a bit of a mixed bag, really. Uh, with regulation like this, it kind of tends to push com um, smaller companies uh, to work with 
uh, the larger, more established uh, cloud computing and, and, and service providers, uh, just because they seem a safer option. They are all GDPR certified, and it just seems like the, the easier route to take. Uh, on the positive uh, side of things, it has made, uh, for one, automakers who are, are uh, certainly not tech companies at the moment, but trying to become tech companies, it's made them take uh, their data management very seriously. Uh, it's made them organize their data uh, to actually uh, account, try uh, to account for where it's spaced out around the globe, where uh, which of their uh, uh, dealer network partners have data, how they would be able to track that data and get it back. And then the other uh, part that they've had to take very seriously now uh, is the security side. So those are, are areas that while there's an expense now uh, and it, 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 there, there might be a, a slight negative effect in sort of slowing things down um, in, in the near term, those are, are things that could pay off in the long term. Uh, but I, I, I agree with Winston about uh, the challenges of uh, locating uh, servers and big research projects um, in Europe when you have other options where it's, it's sort of easier uh, to be innovative, uh, it's, it's easier to, to move data around. Although there are other regions that are sort of taking a, a, a cue from uh, GDPR and, and trying to implement their own uh, legislation that's kind of um, either in line or in some cases going further beyond that. So a uh, recent one that's been proposed is uh, in India, and this will take a long time to actually uh, be implemented. Uh, but it's basically, it's, it's GDPR. Uh, some of the, the, the terms have been changed around, so it's not data controller or data processor. There's uh, sort of equivalent phrases for that. The penalties are, are comparable, uh, but then there's sort of this added layer of uh, you're not allowed to transport your data that you generate in India outside of, uh, outside of the country, which raises a whole other level of complexity. So then there's this question around uh, do multinational companies just sort of take the strictest standard and try apply that globally? Do they, do they bother? Uh, with companies like you mentioned Facebook and, 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 and companies that sort of don't have to um, have as much infrastructure on the ground uh, as mobility and transport companies, it's easier to do uh, that sort of thing. But with transport, you kind of have, you have dealer networks, you have hyper-localized effects. Uh, in, in the transport world, cities are, are, are incredibly powerful. So that's something that uh, would, be, would be more localized, and it doesn't seem like that regulation uh, would, would be sort of, you'd have a global data policy if you're a multinational company. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has got any thoughts on that. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Andrew, and I definitely think that there should be some sort of, of unified legislation because uh, the world is changing so much and, and where we're heading, we're heading to, to a borderless world in a way where, where we would interact with pretty much everyone, no matter where in the, the earth they are. So I definitely think that when we speak about GDPR and the way we handle data, we definitely need to look at it and think of how that could work for everyone, not only base it on, on Europe or outside Europe. On the geopolitical angle, I think you know China has said that it wants to be the world leader in artificial intelligence. Yeah. And it is using all the data of Chinese people and, uh, to achieve that objective. And so it's true that we have you know, particularly in Europe, but also in the U.S., you have that sort of geopolitical race to innovation uh, issue where there is a fear that too much regulation will actually hinder the development of artificial intelligence uh, research in Europe. Um, U.S. is a bit between the two, but I think policymakers like, like yourself uh, Karima, um, you also are acutely aware of sort of the the global race for artificial intelligence and autonomous vehicles that, that's going on. Okay, um, so um, with that said, um, we're going to have to close the panel today. I'd like to thank all of the participants um, for that interesting conversation um, and 
I would like to ask anyone if they have any questions. We have a couple of minutes for that. Thank you very much for this discussion. Um, what I'm curious about, we talked or you talked mostly about uh, users that can give consent or refuse consent when they use smart mobility solutions or autonomous vehicles. But um, if we think about autonomous vehicles in particular, uh, they will be full of cameras filming public space for uh, safety reasons as well. And we, we get into a whole other realm of, of privacy issues, I think, because uh, people in public space do not have the ability to give consent uh, for their data to be used, but still there are safety concerns. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts about uh, GDPR or privacy regulation for for you know the more public space side of new mobility services. I, I can comment on that because we we worked on an issue like that uh, where um, an equipment manufacturer wanted to do experimentation with with video uh, to for autonomous vehicles. So so obviously the video captures uh, the faces of pedestrians, and so under GDPR. You know the 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 answer to that is well why don't you why don't you uh, pixel out the the faces right just like in uh, uh, Street View. But the researchers said uh, no actually we can't because uh, having the facial expression helps us determine where the pedestrian is looking, and that helps our algorithms get the safety part better. Uh, so there's a really, I, I, and I found that interesting because from a simple lawyer point of view, I say, well, just pixel out the, you know, uh, you don't need the faces. And the researchers on safety on autonomous vehicles said, yes, we do, actually, because that can help our algorithms get better. So we have a real balancing act, and obviously you can't get consent, and that's, that's clear. But again, GDPR doesn't require consent when you, other, when you have very important other countervailing values. <laughs> like safety. Um, anyway, that's my own personal experience. Do we have another question down there? Last question. The, the first one is not a question. Please, not a GDPR 2. It's already too difficult to understand GDPR 1. <laughs> the second one, uh, the question is, in fact, the ownership, uh, I let that to legal people because it's too complicated. And uh, as European Mobility, we own the car, so shall we be on the, the data, so on. So it's a, it's a debate. But what is key is the access to the data. Because if we want to make sure that there is fair competition, that there is innovation, that we are changing the, 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 the challenges and improving the current situation, we need access to the data. Yeah, and, and that's what I, I, when I mention control, it's exactly that. So uh, the after access, can the user say, even for safety, that he don't want that, uh, that to give access uh, to the car manufacturer on, the, on his data, data? And I think it's a question. Yeah. Uh, you, can, you can choose, you don't want to be located, so do you, you, you say, I don't want any data to, yeah. to go up in the car manufacturer server. Complicated question. You know, it's <laughs> like uh, you know, obligating people to wear seatbelts. You know, can I say no? I, uh, seatbelts are infringe my personal freedom. <laughs> All right. Um, well, with that said, I think we're out of time. So thank you very much for the panel. <laughs> thank you. So we'll take a 25 minutes break and be back again and we will uh, have our next uh, session on uh, MAS, DAS and SAS, mobility device and software as a service, the mobility makers of tomorrow. Thank you. So back at 11.15.